So hello everybody. Um, my name is Anna Rivakovic. I am an artist and um, for over the last 10 years I've been dealing actually with inflatable structures. So I'm more on the side of the air than water. <laughs> but, um, but there are some water particles in the air. So um, I hope that all sort of will be connected one way or another. So I do, I will show some work, then I realized um, that I actually do have some work where I um, have water elements. So this is a very old work that goes back um, 10 years and it's an um, installation in the old swimming pool in Montreal and was a collaborative piece with two other artists, Lorraine Oates and Ingrid Bachman. And basically we created this mist um, throughout the whole swimming pool uh, using a, a very high pressure uh, nozzles and BVC pipes. So then when people were moving through the space, uh, they were activating uh, different sound. The piece was called Sona, so it was very much based on the idea of uh, detecting objects un under the water. And we kind of, through the interactivity of people, we wanted to um, to create this sound landscape um, that refer to the local environment of the old swimming pool and the neighborhood, etc. Then um, I also I'll made this piece, which also has to do in some way uh, with water. This is an installation on a frozen uh, canal in Montreal and it's uh, called Ice Dome and basically on the right you see an inflatable dome uh, that I made and the water was pumped from under the frozen uh, canal so basically the same method that f ice fishing in the winter so we dropped the pump into the water then the water was pumped um, from under the ice uh, throughout the night so after the period of 10-12 hours um, there was a, a freezing, um, I mean the, the water froze and created an ice shell. So then in the morning we cut out the hole, deflated the form, moved the form to the next spot and started the process again. So in a sense it was like a growing colony of ice dome. And um, they were quite big, you know, the light, acoustics, everything um, sort of played the role of the, of the experience. About six um, five and a half or six meters in diameter and then two and a half uh, feet in in height um, and then over time obviously they were melting away and breaking and deteriorating uh, by nature because we were working uh, on this project with Park Canada um, at the end we were asked to destroy them because it became an issue of the public safety and um, Parks Canada were concerned that there are kids or anybody coming at night and a piece of ice falls on somebody's head. Um, so um, as a performative act of destroying ice dome, not in a natural way, we decided to make a collected all the cr uh, tree, um, Christmas trees that all the people are throwing out at that time. And we decided to make a big bonfire. Well, there are scientists here, <laughs> we never really analyzed that, but the funny thing was that the uh, uh, fire didn't destroy the ice dome. <laughs> we actually had to destroy them manually. And it was very strange because the fire almost made um, the structure stronger, <laughs> which probably makes some uh, sense um, scientifically. Um, and obviously working with, with inflatables for, uh, for, as I said, for X number of years, I mean, I'm very fascinated with, with bubbles. And this is a picture of a soap bubble, and we had discussion yesterday about the soap bubbles. Because they're really, um, and it's what is interesting that soap bubbles uh, were not really started to be analyzed uh, scientifically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in, according to my research, uh, not until 19th century. So considering it, it, it's quite late. And they are really fascinating the way that they connect and also um, because they have um, the largest amount of volume with minimum amount of surface. And um, dealing with inflatable uh, structures for X number of years, uh, having a lot of architectural references, there is always uh, the question that, that I ask myself, why do we live in square houses? <laughs> they are not, they're not very efficient. 
But anyway, this is just a digression. Um, and then RBC as well, dealing with inflatables, I'm very much influenced by architectural group from the 60s. Um, this is an example of Archigram um, from UK, but there were also group Utopie in France and France, uh, Hans Rukako in Austria. Um, this is seaside bubbles as well by uh, Archigram, sort of the module way of, of living and connecting. Um, Hans Rukako, and there's a very nice quote uh, by Bruno Latour that talks um, um, about air condition and talks about bubble, and maybe I'll let you to, to read it uh, quickly. And I like that because it sort of makes a conne connection between the tiny things and the big thing. And later on, I, I sort of would like to bring the concept of design science developed by back Mr. Fuller, in which also the combination of different perspectives is, is very important. And I think at this uh, point, I also want to bring the concept of um, um, the planet Earth as a spaceship craft that also Buckminster Fuller um, developed. Um, because it really um, points out to, 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 to the atmosphere, to the air condition, that we are all in it together. And I mean, it sounds very simple, but I think it's very often we isolate your, ourselves as human from nature. And, and throughout the history of humanity, we can, we can see that separation happening. So the nature is somewhere outside of us where we can throw stuff at and thinking that it just doesn't matter. Well, I think with the um, issues of global warming and everything that we, we, we talk today, um, it's obvious that, <laughs> that it doesn't work that way. And I like sort of this uh, metaphor of the airship because it points out that we are all in it together. Like, imagine as if we were on one ship. I mean, if something goes ro wrong, it affects everything else. And we are just as much affected by it. And, um, yeah, um, I mean, I just have a little um, fragment that Peter Slaughter, the Slaughter Dick, um, in the article, How Big is Big, using the me uh, fullest metaphor of spaceship Earth, proposes a radically different view of the occupancy of our home planet. He pr uh, presents facts of our disconnected attitude uh, towards nature and environment, the idea of nature as all absorbent domain outside of us that we can throw stuff at without any consequences no longer holds together. Our culture in which surfeit, extravagance, and the luxury are granted as civil rights is no longer sustainable. And this is my conversation bubble, and um, um, it's called conversation bubble. Um, basically, it's an inflatable piece that needs five people in order to exist. So in my work, um, you will see maybe yesterday haven't been discussed so much, but in my work, um, participation of the audience, of the people, are a very integrated part of my work. And in this work, uh, the piece, in a sense, doesn't exist without people. So I always kind of explain that people are kind of like corks <laughs> in the structure, so the structure doesn't inflate without people. And the idea is, um, uh, it, it, it's sort of a, an apparatus that one can see for an uh, idea of agreement. So the, the thing is that five people enter the tubes and they are, in a sense, squeezed. Their body is squeezed um, when the blower is, is on. So their body is, in a sense, immobilized and only their heads are sticking out in the big bubble. And basically the performance lasts as, as long as the five people agree to stay there. And they basically nobody can leave without uh, on their on their own accord. So this is kind of like my apparatus for agreement, which could be used for politicians. Um, it would be quite funny. And then obviously dealing with um, inflatables, there's and the um, a, a group the group architectural group from the 60s there's a very close uh, connection between um, <coughs> technology and obviously science technology and i throw this quote because 
I'm in Marseille, I'm in France, and I, and I like this quote, and it's a first, uh, in a sense, in, inflatable, and, and it, it's very interesting to, to see how that sort of technology, or the belief that technology can uh, change humanity and can bring forward, um, you know, different understanding of world, world, and in this case, a different view, I mean, the, the perspective. Um, and even that, um, so the te technological connection with the environment that was very important in, in the already in back in the 60s, which really is the kind of driving force behind my work. Um, and as much as it can be delusion, uh, Peter Slaughter Dick um, distinguishes between two different kinds of uh, te technology, the hetero technology and homo technology, which one is basically the difference is that one, uh, in a sense, it tries to trick the nature when the other it tries to um, imitate, which, which was, um, I think, Yesterday we talked about biomimicry and, and different technologies that are trying to, you know, follow the nature. Um, from the 60s again, Archigram, he, uh, they developed a concept of clothing for living in. So I made um, a prototype of the sleeping bag dress. So it's a, a, a sleeping kimono type dress that uses a solar panel batteries and a small computer fan that when it inflates, um, it changes into a cocoon in which person can sleep. Um, I did a walking performance in this dress in Mexico City, Toulouse actually, um, Brussels and Tallinn and I inflated this dress at different places. I had different interactions with people. In the gallery setup, I made the inflatable replica of the cylinder and projected the video um, onto it that, that showed the documentation of these performances. I'm not going to be focusing on this work because I'm trying to get to the water. <laughs> um, but this is another prototype um, that I also made. Um, and this is, in a sense, an um, example of my collaboration for this project. It's a called SR Hub, um, Socially Responsive Habitat. And it's a basically prototype, bicycle proto mobile bicycle prototype. And I work with the students from Mechanical Engineer at McGill University. And for eight months, every day, we, uh, well, sorry, not every day, every week we met. And um, basically, we came up with, with this prototype. And it was interesting in terms of collaboration because um, as an, it was the first time for the students from mechanical engineer having uh, uh, to deal with an artist, and it was the first time for me to also deal with with, with people that that didn't know much about art. So um, I could see that throughout the process of eight months, how they sort of understanding and and maybe sensitivity towards design change and how my understanding of how things can be done also change so there's two uh, solar panels and two um, dynamos and two uh, sets of batteries that you can produce energy while you bike and i made two trips in finland and poland and i camp with the prototype um, and use the energy to be connected to Skype and showing my friends in Canada that I'm in the remote place, <laughs> but I'm still connected. <laughs> and um, this is another uh, project that, that I did in Finland, which is an inflatable tube of 350 meters that connected an island, Lautasari Island, with the mainland in Helsinki. And this project was um, very much inspired by the idea of link and creating a link between two sides, which is what is bridge-like. And this was my proposition to, to the Finnish company that produce, produced a, biodegra a biodegradable material. So that piece was made with biodegradable material. Well, this was the proposition. So in my imagination, I would like, I wanted to kind of have an arc. Well, in reality, it didn't quite happen like that because we were inflating from one side. Um, so the tube was twisting and turning and sort of enveloping itself through and, and creating this snake that went across the water. 
And I guess just one thing um, that I can mention here, it's, it was an interesting thing for me because then I realized why link has to be straight. You know, in my drawing, which I imagined this, this work as a drawing in landscape, I thought, well, why the link is, has to be straight? Well, actually, in reality, the links are never straight. So it was interesting experience me, uh, for me because the work spoke back to me and, and, and sort of unexpected all the, in quotation, failure um, it was in failure because it point out to something else. And this was an inspiration to the work that I'm working on now um, in Rome, which is basically a proposition of creating uh, two missing arches on the ancient Roman bridge that is called Ponte Rotto, and I'm in the middle of working on it, so this is just an idea. But I do want to get to the cloud <laughs> because this is why I'm here. Um, so this is a, a, an inflatable cloud that I made, and basically it's a it's an inflatable object with four uh, bladders inside. Uh, the object floats on helium, so there's four compartments that that uh, for helium, and there are water bottles and pump. So basically the idea is that um, well, and participation. This is how work the work operates is that one, when people pump the water to the cloud, the cloud basically becomes heavier. There is a water um, um, compartment as well as the helium inside. And because water uh, cloud becomes heavier, cl clouds comes down. So it, it goes down and at a certain moment, um, the um, water overflows and then the cloud rains, <laughs> in quotation. <laughs> Um, but it would be nice if, um, oh yeah, there was a scientist yesterday with the vapors and <laughs> I was thinking, huh, maybe I can improve my piece. <laughs> um, so the cloud rains and then it becomes lighter and then it moves up. So uh, talking about sort of the wow moment that Patrice and Javier yesterday described, I mean, when uh, I have to say, when, when the piece work, it's really actually quite tricky and complicated to make it work perfectly. Uh, there is this wow moment, <laughs> you know, where, where, when you use this object and it sort of like moves, it's, it's really quite beautiful. And in a sense, I was thinking of, of, of this is like a scientific, um, experiment or the way that I, I see it that is presented um, to or it's accessible to people, to audience. So, so actually the people can get this wow moment. That it doesn't necessarily always have to be just in the lab or, or you know, uh, separated. At least this is how I think about it. Um, oh yeah. And um, there's a little um, part of the quote um, by Sabadi. So, so, so in a sense, this piece, for me, um, very much, again, which my work is driven a lot by this desire to create the interconnectedness between human and nature and the environment. So in a sense, this is a kind of a, a metaphorical way of, of showing this connection by participatory um, actions of, of people, of the <coughs> audience. And um, in terms of, uh, this is the detail of the, of the drops, <laughs> yes. Um, and to make maybe also um, a comment about the collaboration, I've been collaborating on this project with an uh, um, engineer, and, and actually uh, the interesting moment is that water wasn't originally, in my mind, water wasn't part of the piece. So actually, as a matter of fact, well, I can say water is incidental, but, but it is not because, because it became very much inherited part of the piece in terms of the technique and meaning, but it came through the collaboration with the engineer. Because my objective at the very, very beginning is what that I wanted to have a movement of the cloud, um, a, um, vertical movement of the cloud. I didn't want it to have a horizontal. We are familiar with that, or at least this is how I was thinking. So for me, it was very important to have a vertical movement. 
And then the second important part for me was the participation of people. So the second part was that something happened when people do something. So um, at first in my mind, uh, was that I wanted that people blow air because I, I, I've been working with inflatables. So I thought, well, if people blow air to it, and then I was trying to figure out, well, is it possible that, you know, something changes, you know, that, that then when everybody, I had no idea. Then after I started to talk to the engineer, and I said, well, air is not going to do anything. It's basically, it's not, it's, it, it's not going to pro produce enough of the weight difference because this is a, the only way that you can really make um, the, 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 the object move up and down. You know, on helium, yes, we, we, we knew that. Um, so then by talking and thinking, then we have all water. And then it was amazing because everything sort of came together, like the, the, the actual meaning of the piece grew on me and through that collaboration. So um, I just thought that I would mention that because obviously we were asked to talk about collaborations. Um, but at the end, um, I don't know how much time I have. Okay, so maybe I can still squeeze design science. <laughs> um, I would like to talk about design science because I'm very much fascinated by it and interested and also because it could be maybe a, a, a way of thinking about art science collaborations and I thought that in this um, setup it, it might be relevant. So design science, uh, it, it's, a, it's a concept developed by Buckminster Fuller, uh, again in 65, I think, or something like that. Um, and it's a problem-solving approach which entails a rigorous systematic study of the deliberate ordering of the components in the universe. And then all the words are very important here, so rigorous, systematic, deliberate, ordering <laughs> the universe. Um, and because, because actually my title was the anti-atropic role of art and as a kind of proposition to again the the questions of science art collaborations and anti-atropic in scientists can we correct me again we are talking about thermodynamics we are talking about the second second law and we are talking about uh, so so entropy is this um, measuring uh, property of energy which basically uh, creates, well, in the more traditional thing, understanding entropy is more related to, to, to energy loss or waste or energy that is um, not capable to, to produce work no longer. So there's a, the sense of, of um, disorder, there's a sense of chaos, and I mean, I know a little bit, or at least what I've read, that it's a kind of more traditional way of, of understanding entropy. But nevertheless, for the simplicity of things, um, I thought that, that it could be kind of a proposition to think about the art as an anti-entropic uh, role. So meaning, um, as an as a, as a agent that perhaps is capable through imagination or through creativity or through the different processes capturing the energy that maybe otherwise would be lost. This is a metaphor, obviously. And, and I think, ah, oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to go there, not yet. Um, but I think then we have to understand what is design, okay because that hasn't been really talked much about and how does Buckminster Fuller understands design. So I think it's very important in his understanding that design is actually not, a, a pro, not specific to, to, profession, to different professional, um, uh, you know, different professions. We are familiar with interior design, architecture design, fashion design, graphic design. I mean, we, we, we can talk about different designs. So he's not very much about the fragmentation of the concept of design. So design is not something that is applicable to specific discipline. Design, as he, in his understanding, it's a basically a creative process 
that underlines all human activities. So from that large perspective, I mean, he talks that very often designs or activities suffer because of the narrow intentions. So in his design science concept, the, the, there's a three elements to it. So the, we start with intentions, goals, which comes then he sort of says, which comes from experience, however experience can be defined as well. And then we take actions in order to realize them. So, so design, it's a process of realizing intentions. And then um, science is an important element in this sort of equation because it produces the more, what, what, what is here, the more rigorous systematic method of evaluation. And basically, this process of evaluation is very important in, in, in this concept. So it's a process of realizing intentions. And the science produces this uh, monitoring evaluation agent that can produce the, the, the evaluation. And what is interesting is that in this concept of design science, there's no such a thing as failure. And when I was, where I was talking before about my work and sort of speaking back to me, uh, because in design science, the failure is just basically a departure po point to the next uh, adjustments. So it kind of produces the spi spiral of ev uh, evolution. So you know that there's no such a thing as, as failure per se because, because it just means if we do keep in mind our intention and we do take action to a realization, then if it doesn't work, it just means we have to keep adjusting something. So in a sense, it's, it's kind of a scientific also um, way of, of approaching things. Um, I think probably that I will, um, yes. So at the end, I just want to, um, again, because it's connected to, to somewhat to the water. So this is just a really sketch of the, of the project in which um, I'm going to be doing research and development. So this is, this is a basically my, my future research and development project is going want to combine the uh, pneumatic technology, inflatable technology with hydroponics, which is the ancient system of growing plants without uh, soil. So there's lots of uh, question in it. This is really just, as I said, sketch. Um, I'm very much interested in, again, creating, um, as, um, creating a setup, which is what I'm really interested in. It's, it's creating a setup in which, again, the, the interconnection between human and nature sort of will be emphasized. So I am, for example, thinking, and I, I don't know if it's possible, I'm thinking about things like, you know, well, what about if people would blow uh, into the bubble, I mean, we blow, we, uh, we release CO2, well, plants need CO2, so can we create some kind of symbiotic um, correlation where plants will depend on us, but we also depend on plants? So I'm sort of interested in this kind of, um, um, creating this kind of relation. And at the very, very end, because I think, um, the whole questions of the art science, you know, and the split or not split, it, it sort of uh, deals a lot with the question of aesthetics. Um, as yesterday, uh, Jean-Marc was saying, aesthetic uh, science. And, and I really, really love this quote uh, from Buckminster Fuller because in a sense, it kind of points out to, to this moment of, of the special of the, to, to this special moment. Meaning, as an artist and, and um, working on my work, I, I don't necessarily think about aesthetics. I do also go in a similar way that perhaps scientists of problem solving. So when you think about the problem solving, you, you, you deal with kind of different parameters. Yet, as he says, at the end, if, if you look at your solution that you found to your problem, and if solution is not beautiful, that means that it's wrong. 
that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, any urgent question to Anna while our role is setting up? I have a question. In the rotation of uh, the piece that sold out the first one, uh, the there, was word, there was this word about keeping the main operating. Who be the delivery uh, agent? Deliver it, uh, okay. I guess, in my understanding, it also goes back to, to thinking of the sort of scientific approach, deliberate, systematic, so to creating a certain um, way by which you can do the monitoring or evaluation. No, ordering sort of deals with, with more of the uh, preposition of believe that then in a sense uh, everything in it around is is order right i mean then i'm not it's it's it can be you know uh, there is the theory of the chaos but maybe chaos is all also order i mean it, it goes into philosophical or uh, what is ordering but in the sense of this anti-atropic role of art it's in a sense of bringing order to this order, which is how traditionally the entropy is understood. It's sort of the philosophical proposition. 